Again, uh, thank you for attending our session. Uh, our session is around vSAN uh, and uh, why we believe it is the best solution for cloud provider environments. Uh, normal disclaimer, we don't have anything forward looking here um, per se, but I do wanna say that my senior director is in the back of the room, so please do not ask really hard questions for that's us. Right, so, that's right, that's right. You know, please make sure, um, you know, we. Greg and I are not that smart, so. Yeah, and it goes downhill from here. <laughs> uh, so quick agenda, uh, we're gonna do a quick recap of vSAN for cloud providers. Greg is gonna go through uh, some of the uh, best practices and lessons learned. Uh, I'm gonna cover vSAN and the cloud provider program. Uh, Greg will go through some of the cost benefits and analysis we've seen with vSAN. And uh, we're gonna go into getting started with vSAN for cloud providers. How is it? Uh, utilize, what is the operational model, some of the best practices, and then integration with cloud provider architecture. Uh, we'll wrap up with some key takeaways on you know, things that Greg and I use in the field for our cloud providers. And uh, again, please ask us any questions. Um, uh, there's a mic up here if you wanna yell them out. Uh, again, this is uh, education for you guys on what we've learned on adopting vSAN for a lot of cloud providers globally. This, and this session is recorded, so if you use the microphone, it'll it'll get on the recording. If you don't, I'll have to we'll have to repeat your question just to and just to get it. And this deck is also going to be available uh, online. I have a QR code at the end, so you'll be able to snap it and grab this entire deck along with a lot of the speaker notes, which I put a lot of data in there. So uh, introduce myself. I'm Daniel Paluzic. I'm part of the solution engineering team. Uh, covering uh, Americas. I have uh, government and federal customers, and then I have strategic accounts in the Southeast. My name is Greg Kaffenberger. I'm with the Cloud Partner Strategy and Architecture team, formerly known as the Global Cloud Practice, for those of you who've been around for a while. Um, and I just want to touch real quick on what the Cloud Practice is, um, because, because some of uh, our service providers can really take advantage of it. So we're an overlay team for, for Daniel's team. So what happens is, is you can put in an AA engagement and we can, the, the uh, strategy and architecture team can come in to a service provider and help you build your strategy, do architecture. You know, if you're trying to adopt VCD and you're trying to make a business case, we can help you with that. If you have the business case and you've chosen VCD, we can help you build an architecture to deploy it. So we can take it from the beginning to the end. We can even work with your salespeople if you're trying to uh, sell a, let's say you're trying to monetize uh, I don't know, NSX micro segmentation within VCD, we can even get down to the nuts and bolts and help you figure out how to do that. Even vSAN, right? I'm not, we're gonna talk about vSAN this whole time. So I wanted to uh, make sure we covered all the bases. That's right. So why are we here? Uh, we believe that vSAN is a very optimal model for cloud service providers. This is a pay as you go subscription model. What I mean by that is, this is all based on the utilization of storage on a monthly basis within a vSAN and data store. We're gonna talk about some of the details and uh, some of the approaches within this. Second is, it's easy to use. Um, what we have seen in the implications of a very easy and tightly coupled hyperconverged architecture is a simplified op operational model for cloud providers. We are taking out the complexity uh, from these architectures that many cloud providers have multi-vendor strategies with that, and we're simplifying it. Last of all, it's future-proof in your architecture. Uh, Software-defined data center architecture is here to stay. It's growing at a uh, significant clip, and Greg's gonna talk here shortly on some of the growth uh, within uh, cloud providers. So, Greg? Thank you, thank you. All right, so. Just to level set what vSAN actually is. So it's a, it, it runs on x86 servers. It runs on the host that you currently have. It uses the hard drives that are within your current host. Is, is, does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any questions on the base level of what vSAN is? Because it's very, very important. I know that uh, most of you are probably technologists and, uh, and get this stuff. So it's managed through per VM storage policies. We're gonna talk a lot about that, why it's important, why it's different than what's out there, things like that. And it's deeply integrated with the VMware stack. So the ecosystem really helps fuel the adoption of vSAN. It really helps um, the hyper-converged story. And uh, hopefully you take away some points uh, around that. vSAN adoption for cloud providers is exploding. I know in the cloud practice, I'm stuck calling it that because it's been called that forever, but I know in the architecture and strategy team, we do many, many, many engagements around vSAN. The, the world is going 
hyper-converged and cloud providers are, 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 are on the forefront of that, right? And because you have to worry about everything, costs, manageability, operations, supportability, those things like that. So it's critical. We have some big deployments out there. Um, this is a service provider, right? So I'm not gonna quote any stats from enterprises. We're talking to, you know, we're gonna keep it in our, in our patch. We have 11 plus terabyte, uh, pet, petabytes deployed at a customer that I actually support. So, um, so I'm very intimate with that, with that customer. And we, do, we have 2x growth. You know, it's, it's, been, it's really been explosive. So you've, you've heard the hybrid cloud story probably a hundred times, right? I promise we're going to get through these basic, these basic what is vSAN market, marketing slides quickly, but uh, just to level set. The vSAN in a hybrid cloud environment utilizing the VMware ecosystem is very, very powerful, right? Integration with SRM, inter integration with VROPS, you know, moving workloads from on-premises to the cloud using VMware tools is very seamless. That's what's fueled the growth. That's what, you know, that's what pushed this hyper-converged story, this hybrid cloud story from, uh, you know, to, to pass the competition. All right, so now let's get into some, some, some real stuff here. How to get started. So for those of you familiar with VVDs, you know, there's a, you know, VVD4, I'll say .x, because when this slide was, was built, uh, you know, we were on 4.1, but we could be higher than that. You might have seen the consolidated pod architecture. And what that means is you can do four hosts, you can start off with four hosts in a consolidated pod architecture, right? We're talking service provider here. We're not talking about the absolute bare minimum. We're talking about you're a service provider. What should you start with? Four hosts should be the minimum, right? And this is a, this is a consolidated pod that has management infrastructure and compute infrastructure. It's gonna run your NSX edges Check out this VVD. It's kind of it's it's for service providers. I think it's game changing as far as cost reduction and manageability. You know, a lot of a lot of times you'll have management infrastructure, you'll have compute infrastructure, you'll have edge infrastructure, and uh, it and it and it becomes costly just to get started, right? So check out the consolidated pod. vSAN supports a lot of network architectures, but obviously the most common and the most current is the leaf spine. The reason I put this slide up here is because each host is designed to work with two 10 gig interfaces. vSAN really only needs one for performance, but obviously you're a cloud provider, so you wouldn't run just one. And we're also even seeing 40 gig in some cases too, as prices fall down, so. Right. Again, it's, it really comes down to leaf spine and uh, uh, the architecture that we're seeing prevalent. Yeah, and this is getting started. So what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to hopefully convey is we just want to take a baby step, right? We're putting our toe in the water. What does it take? You know, how, how deep do you have to get? Do you have to build storage backend networks? You know, how does the sync and the replication, all that work? You get two 10 gigs on a host and, and, and you're in business. So, so this is where the kind of the magic happens, and, and we're going to talk. We'll, we'll talk a lot about this. We can answer a lot of questions about this. This is the storage policy-based management, or SPBM, as you'll see it on a lot of our, our documents. Is the is the technology that allows us to create a storage policy and apply it to a VM VM disk. So you can you can control fault tolerance method uh, methods. You can control essentially performance and availability from this policy. And for cloud providers, this is absolutely critical because I, I've operated in a cloud environment for a very long time before I worked at VMware, and I know that from one day to the next, I have absolutely no idea what kind of customer I'm gonna get. We pretend to target specific customers, right? But the truth is, we just want some customers, right? So we'll take a small customer, take a medium customer, we'll take a customer who needs fast storage, we'll, we'll probably bite off more than we can chew and take a crazy database customer, right? That's just how it is. So, uh, so, so what you need is you need flexibility in order to service the needs of your customer in the moment. So when you're out there talking, the customer says, you know, hey, I need an aggregate of a million IOPS. Right, so what's your method to do that? Well, you know, you could, you, you, your choices are limited, 
right? You can either try to make a, uh, um, a massive capital business case, or you can upgrade or buy hosts and, and use those for many things. So in the policy, we wanted to highlight one specific area, and that's the failures to tolerate, because this is, this is where even a, 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 a basic customer will, will be able to take advantage. So if you say, so let's say, let's say you're, you, you get a donut store customer, right? They're just making donuts, they just need their point of sale to work, right? You might wanna do FTT2 because with fault tolerance, fault, fault tolerance to two, because during the morning from eight o'clock or from six o'clock to 10 o'clock, if they go down, they are not selling donuts, they are out of business, right? Let's just keep it to the basics. That's what, that's what service providers do. You, you, just, you just enable the selling of donuts in, a, in, in different fashions. So then you might have another one that's a database customer that is, the only thing they care about is speed and and maybe they can, maybe they do backups or they have replicated databases. They have, uh, they have software-based methods of fault tolerance and they just need speed. You might do RAID 1, FTT 1. So there's all sorts of options here and I hope this stuff helps to illuminate you know, how the flexibility in a cloud provider is so critical, absolutely critical. And again, to reiterate, this is at the per VM level too. We're so used to in past storage architectures on utilizing a RAID array or a disk group on that and applying it to multiple data stores. We can apply this at the VMDK level and it's very important when we understand what that assessment of that data profile is and those virtual machine workloads are. And the unique value here is the granular capability uh, that we can apply against a homogenous environment. So this, sli so this slide is just a touch on the key characteristics of vSAN, what makes it what makes it important uh, in, in your world, right? The distributed performance profile, the ability to do 10,000 IOPS in a host and millions of IOPS in a host, right? You may only need two or three hosts or five hosts for a customer that needs millions and millions of IOPS, whereas the, whereas the basic customer only needs you know, well, maybe 1,000 IOPS per VM, who knows? Scale up and out, this is, this is a, uh, a key to what I was talking about earlier. You don't have to buy the same host over and over and over. It's a misconception. You don't have to put the same disks in every single host, right? If you wanna, if, it makes it easier to manage, sure. I mean, everybody wants the same hosts, but unfortunately time moves on and technology changes and things happen. You can't do it all the time. So we do, you know, scale up and scale out is critical. 10 gig is the minimum for, for all flash. That's the basic, you know, just stay at 10 gig and utilize the compute hosts you have. There, I walk into data centers and talk to customers where they buy, you know, they buy these Dell hosts or HP hosts or whatever they're buying and the things have 16 slots in them, right? And they're boot off SAN. I said, well, why, why, do, you, why do you buy these, you know, 2U 16 slot you know, hosts, and they say, well, because we use the same host for everything. We use the same host for Colo, we use the same host for, and this, that's our host. We've certified it with, with every software that we have, and you know, we've, we, we, you know, we, that's what we do. Lots of opportunity there to uh, realize different, you know, realize your investment and, and maintain profitability. Don't reinvent the wheel, okay? Like, I know this, our service providers have some insanely smart people, right? This is not the area you wanna prove it. Buy ready nodes, okay? Get on the website, sit your customer down, let's say it's a private cloud deal, right? And, and you're trying to figure out performance profiles and things like that. Sit your customer down, go to the ready node website, figure out what performance you need, and pick out the server, right? The, the, VMware tests this stuff, Dell tests this stuff, the other vendors test this stuff, and, we, and, and it's absolutely critical when in a hyper-converged environment that you don't take on the mantle of proving that you can build a better host than the manufacturer, right? Maybe you can, you absolutely can, but maybe you can't. So we just, 
Just trust me when I say we've lived this. <laughs> this is the way to do it. Go on the ready node, get the ready node. You can, and you can modify them, right? So in this presentation, you'll see the link to a, to a blog that, uh, that basically says here are the things you can change, right? So you can change memory, you can change how many disks. It, you can do anything you want. It's every budget, every vendor. So, so that, so it's, so it's, uh, you know, just trust me, buy the ready note. <laughs> All right, so Daniel's gonna talk about the, the vSAN in the program yep. and, uh, and, and how you can, how the subscription how you can, now, now that I've convinced you that you want it, now here's how to buy it. All right, so uh, I'm gonna do a poll. Um, if you can actually break out um, your phone and uh, go to menti.com uh, and uh, use code 60466. Uh, what I'm asking here is a true or false question. It's kind of a trick question here. Uh, you are, you, are you charged for allocated or configured VM storage in the VMware cloud provider program on vSAN? So I wanna see if, uh, for the cloud providers in the room, uh, if uh, we have a uh, level of understanding of how vSAN works. I'm talking about, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. So this is in the context of the virtual machine itself. So if I allocate a one terabyte VMDK to a virtual machine, am I charged one terabyte on a monthly basis in vSAN? It sounds like we, we have some smart people in the room here. Now don't so. change your answer because you see the other people, <laughs> all right? Like don't let peer pressure affect your, Good. we're here this, to help. This is great, so I'm happy to see that. So. Uh, Oh, that's amazing. Thanks for the news update. That's awesome. We, 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 can, we can put that on the screen as soon as we're done. <laughs> that's the next true and false question. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> so uh, uh, everybody that said false, uh, that's correct. So the beauty of this program is you pay for the used storage in the vSAN data store. Now, for those of you who have worked with vSAN, what does vSAN do? VMs are thin provisioned, right? So if I have a guest OS, allocated 500 gigs, but I install Windows on there or an operating system using 40 gigs. On the vSAN data store, we're only actually charging for 40 gigs within that monthly operational model. So that's very important when we look at the cost model here. You're only charged for what's actually used within the guest OS. And we have a we have a, the a example too. Yeah, right? we do have an example yeah. we're gonna go through. Now that's using the default storage policy. Again, if you're doing object reservation or whatnot, that changes it to uh, you know, a pseudo thick provisioned virtual machine. So there's two models within vSAN as a service or in the subscription model. A general vSAN usage, pay for what you're using within the vSAN data store, or horizon concurrent connections per month. So on the horizon side, we have many customers that use the different horizon models, uh, standard, advanced, enterprise. This is what I like to call uh, all you can eat vSAN. Uh, we charge based off the high watermark of concurrent connections per month, and it doesn't really matter how much vSAN you use on the back end on that. So it's very cost effective, and it gives a nice track record on exactly what are we using within the program. And our, lar our largest enterprise customers, by the way, all started on the, on the horizon side. So it proves out nicely, proves the use case really nicely. So this is uh, getting into more of the detail. Hey, hey Daniel, yes. we have one question. Oh. Sorry, I have one question. Yeah. That's a great question. Hold that question. So the question was, is that inclusive of deduplication and compression? So to fast forward, and I'll cover that shortly, is that is post deduplication and compression. So whatever efficiency we get, let's say I'm writing 20 gigs to disk and I'm getting a two to one ratio, I only write 10 gigs to disk. Yeah, that's I'm what only you pay charged for. on 10 gigs. So another value added point by using deduplication. Now, your mileage may vary. You gotta know your workload. You gotta know exactly what that data profile is and if you can get efficiency on that because why? There's IO implications of using deduplication and compression. And the architecture when you're building your vSAN nodes, uh, you can optimize for dedupe or you can optimize for performance. So um, there's a lot of choices there. So this is a picture from the product usage guide. Um, if you don't know the product usage guide and you're part of the cloud provider program, 
please go to Partner Central, get a copy of this. This is kind of what I like to call my Bible on understanding the entire program, right? I, I even look at this on a daily basis just to keep myself straight on here. We have two models of vSAN inside of the cloud provider pro program. We have standard and advanced, and then you can have the enterprise add-on. The key difference is, again, uh, what features you're using. Now we'll talk about how is this metered automatically and providing that capability, but it's very similar to what you see on the perpetual side uh, between the options. And again, it's all based on a point value, right? So vSAN starts at 0 .04. Uh, get, uh, points per gig per month on that, and then we add that on uh, within that. There is a specific hyperconverged bundle for VxRail environments that is tightly coupled for uh, go-to-market with our Dell EMC uh, partners. So the Horizon desktop, if we look at the detail of this, there's two flavors. We have the hyperconverged bundle, so very similar to what we talked about on the general uh, vSAN usage, and then we have general Horizon desktops. The key difference between this is the hyperconverged bundle has a vSAN Enterprise add-on on there. So it's a two-point spread between the general Horizon desktops, which includes vSAN Advanced, while uh, the HCI bundle includes the Enterprise features and functionality. Again, I mentioned this before, it's all you can eat vSAN. There's no metering of the allocated uh, used or disk on that. And this is something that's manually reported through iAsset. Um, I did actually write a PowerShell script recently on gathering that data from Horizon on a monthly basis. Uh, so I'll have a link at the end on uh, you know, making that easier for our uh, cloud providers. Show off. So <laughs> I'm gonna pass it over to Greg and he's gonna talk about the cost benefits of vSAN. All right, so let's just start at hyper at hyperconverge. I mean, the world is 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 really changing when you go into both enterprise and service provider, and 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 hyperconverge finally has a couple of years, a few years of actual of actual uh, data for for cost savings and opex savings and capex savings and the whole nine yards. And you know, as teams converge. You know, as your, as your virtualization teams learn storage and your storage teams learn virtualization, um, it, it gets a lot simpler. And that's, and that's one of the key areas where vSAN kind of really takes, takes, a, takes a chunk out of this, work, this workload. And I'm not saying a VM workload, but like the people workload, like what you have to do every day, right? So. You know, you'll configure policies when your customer needs something, right? You don't have to. You don't have to think ahead and say, "Okay, well, I need, you know, this much RAID five. I need this much RAID one. I need this much all flash. I need this much spinning disk." You can, you can really kind of uh, go as you as you bring on customers. So this slide, I want to, you know, I'm kind of going to talk about a little different uh, take on this slide because. As a service provider, your world is a little different than, than anyone else's, right? So basically what this slide is, is trying to say is, is, is you used to have to buy storage systems. You used to, you know, when you run out of storage, you used to have to make big jumps and buy, you know, buy big, big heavy priced things, expensive things, big rack space things, and put them, you know, and maintain them. And with vSAN, you're buying hosts and you're, and you're, you're scaling up and you're scaling out, right? But in a cloud provider, in a cloud provider, this is, this is absolutely critical because you don't want to buy that hardware until you absolutely need it, and you don't want to buy more than you need, right? You want to keep your cost and your, um, and your income closely aligned, and, and, that's, and that's absolutely critical. And what happens when you have a customer in your multi-cloud or your, or your, your multi-tenant or your multi-cloud you know, uh, customer, and they say, you've convinced me. I've had 10 VMs in, you know, in, your, in your vCloud director or whatever. I've had 10 VMs there, and, and we've never gone down, and I wanna, I'm gonna move everything, but I need a private cloud. And, and it's critical that I, that I wanna use a, a fiber channel SAN for, for whatever use case that they're trying to solve. Well, you have, this customer might be consuming 50 terabytes of vSAN, right? You've got them in the host, you're paying every month for the, you know, for the, for the, for the vSAN licenses. You can move that customer over to private cloud, 
your costs on the vSAN then go back down until, until you get another customer to consume that, right? Very, very flexible. Absolutely critical to running an efficient cloud provider. You, we don't ever want to lose a customer, but when they grow to private cloud, right, you can take advantage of that. All right, so let's talk about acquisition costs a little bit. We, I know we touched, about, touched on this, but storage, you know, storage costs gradually fall over time. Right, so take advantage of that. Don't buy a bunch of stuff up front. Right, buy it as you need it. Um, you know, utilize the, you know, the the opposite nature of 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 prices and storage. Which who knows how long it'll happen? It'll keep going, but but uh, take advantage of it while you can. Operational cost. We talked about this a little bit too. Your operational roles merging. Right, you can take. I saw a stat the other day that basically said uh, architecture engineers, um, the next step is cloud architecture, right? So you have to create that next step within your service provider for your, to, to, to career path your engineering talent. Because if you don't, they're gonna take that, they're gonna find that role, right? So, and that's a, it's, it's a converged role. Streamline deployment and, and uh, reduce footprint. All right, Daniel wrote a script. He told you about it. I'm sure he's got several more that can help you with that. You're going to see some stuff about Cloud Pod later, I think, right? Yep. So, um, you know, the VMware ecosystem makes it easy. All right, so we can, we can write scripts, we can do automation, really help you. So better agility, faster time to deployment and utilization. This is, this is, this is the same exact stuff we've been saying, just kind of summed up, right? Overall lower costs because of hyper-converged infrastructure, overall, overall better agility because you can burst up, you can burst down your costs, right? And you can buy it as you go. All right, we do have a cost calculator. Is it coming soon still? It's coming soon, yes. It should be out soon, so on our Cloud Solutions website, so. Yeah, so, uh, you know, wait for that. <laughs> All right, so. VSAN OPEX summary. I don't know how to sum this up any better than what we have done. I mean, it's a less complex design for staffing. You have, whether or not you know this, your staff knows this. They're, they're over there plugging away on routers and switches, thinking about, okay, like, I better, like, I better learn NSX. I mean, believe me, they're thinking it. They're plugging away over there on their fiber channel SAN going, I see vSAN over there. Like, what is happening? So you're gonna have to do something there. 30% uh, reduction in manpower. I, I took the stat out that we had. This was the Greg and Daniel uh, poll, poll we did with our service providers, so. Yeah, I took the stat out. I just thought that the, the data, um, you know, the, the data was, was uh, you know, just us, so. Um, but, but, but I've done this in a large service provider. We've moved from big SANs to vSAN, and it dramatically reduced the cost, it dramatically reduced the manpower, and uh, yesterday we were in a meeting and they said, uh, we're never going back. So, um, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're a service provider, they have SLAs, right, they have performance SLAs, uptime availability SLAs, I mean, this is the real deal. Um, you know, this is, the, the, the consolidated vendor model, th this, is, this is both good and bad, right? You know, you're gonna hit your wagon to one vendor, right? You're gonna, you're gonna be able to expand your vendor relationships. I know in my, in my accounts, um, we're pretty locked step with Dell. Um, you know, we go, to, we go to market together, we, we you know, we, we win deals together. You might have that same relationship with another vendor. You're going to be able to lean in deep with that vendor, and and it's and it's it's really an important thing for a cloud provider to be able to rely and lean in and depend on their vendors. And the financial burn is smaller, right? You got to buy hosts anyway, right? So, um, you know, at least you at least have a take strategic approach to your capex. All right, so Dan's gonna take over here, vSAN best practices. Thanks, Greg. No problem. All right, so we're gonna get into some of the uh, practical uh, features of the operational model. 
uh, usage meter, which is our metering application, will meter vSAN on a per month basis. So what it does, it looks at the overall operational usage of vSAN on a capacity perspective, and this is reported in what we call the cluster history report on that. Now, um, this may be ironic for some of you, but uh, usage meter does have a lot of intelligence built into uh, for and logic built in for vSAN. So there is a algorithm that runs on usage meter that will actually detect what is actually being used on a vSAN cluster level. This screenshot, this table right here is coming from the product detection white paper we have under Partner Central. If you don't have this, please go grab that. Uh, this has uh, the logic and the functionality of usage meter from a uh, automatic billing and roll up for not just vSAN, NSX, vRealize operations and so forth. But this table actually shows exactly what is the logic on when I use a standard licensing, uh, enterprise license, even if I use an enterprise license and I'm not using deduplication and compression or let's say a stretch cluster, you're not getting charged for that. So that's a very interesting topic because when we look at this on a per cluster basis, we wanna make sure it's the most cost effective model on that. And if you're not using that feature, why are you gonna pay for it, right? That's the whole beauty of this model. So this um, PDF, please grab that and definitely make sure you're aware of that because that will change your overall pricing structure that you pay on a per uh, point basis. We mentioned this before, um, but um, you know, your capacity and billing best practices, right? Again, you're only paying for what's used on disk. However, when Greg talked about your failure tolerance method or your failures to tolerate, that will actually have implications. Why? Well, my RAID 1 policy compared to RAID 5 or RAID 6 has requirements from a capacity perspective. So if I'm trying to maintain three failures failures to tolerate on a RAID 1, I need 4x the capacity compared to, let's say, a RAID 6 using failures to tolerate of two, that's 1.5x, right? So there is serious implications with that. And if you're pricing it right to your customer, they shoulder the burden of that. So you would, you would say if you want a policy that has three, you know, three failures to tolerate, that's a different price that applies to just that individual VM, which moves the conversation to a much higher level. The customer says, oh, well, maybe I don't need that. It's, you know, four times the price. Yep. You say, well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Our recommendation is here, and here's the price. That's right. We, I mentioned this before. Deduplication and compression runs before the blocks hit disk. So any efficiency gain you get on that, it's not only saving points, it's saving your end dollars, right? At the end of the day, you want to actually have a very cost-effective model on that. On a hour, excuse me, a 24-hour basis, we show up a roll-up under the cluster history report. So you can actually track what you're using from a vSAN cluster perspective on a daily basis. And this can also be orchestrated and pulled through the usage meter API too. So be aware of that. And that's something that gives you line of sight on what you're using from a vSAN perspective. So this is an example. I have a couple other examples in the speaker notes, but I wanted to walk through how would this be priced in a point perspective. So I have a 100 gigabyte virtual machine that's allocated, but only 20 gigs written to disk within this virtual machine. I'm only using one point, one VCPP point, right? And the list price of a, a point in the program is a dollar, right? And everybody has different tiers. But think of that for a moment here. I'm only using a single point. So let's walk through this example. This is a virtual machine with eight gigs of VRAM associated with it. And that's important. I'll explain why. 100 gig VMDK, but 20 gigs in use. I have a storage policy that's using RAID 5 with failures to tolerate of two, right? So we're actually you know, making yeah, it's sure. A, it's a highly available. Uh, yeah, high, yeah, highly example. available solution on that. Yeah. And we're also using deduplication and compression. So this is using vSAN advanced, right? I'm assuming a two to one ratio. Why? That's what we're using on the calculator too. And that's kind of what we see across the board on that. But again, know your workload. So if I take that efficiency, from 20 uh, using two to one, that brings it down to 10 gigs in use. Based on a RAID 5 and a failure to tolerate of two, it's a 1.5x capacity factor. So I need 15 gigs of um, storage on that. Now, before vSAN 6.7, there's something called your swap space for memory, right? So when I power on a virtual machine, I have to RAID 1 that. I'm gonna keep a swap file. That has changed now in vSAN 6.7. 
by default, there's something called sparse swap that's now enabled by default, does not create a swap file anymore. So, so even for your huge VMs, exactly. it, it reduces the price for your large VMs. Why? Because now we don't have to store it within the vSAN data store, right? Now I don't have to pay for that swap space on a monthly basis. You don't have to explain to your customer how you came up with the number that you're gonna charge them for storage, <laughs> which, you know, for me, makes it, makes it a lot better. And especially when we're talking about thousands of VMs, that yeah. can add up. I mean, if I have 1,000 VMs, eight gigs uh, uh, per VM on that, yeah. that's eight terabytes times two, that's 16 terabytes I gotta pay on a monthly basis. So you can see how that adds up quickly. Still worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's assume I'm using vSAN 6.6 6 here. I'm going to actually take that in effect. So I got 16 gigs for the swap space. So 15 plus 16 is 31. On that, times 0 0.06 for using vSAN advanced, that's 1.86 points on a monthly basis. Now, here's another interesting tidbit of usage meter. Usage I meter. Fix this. I have to fix this. <laughs> usage meter does not round up. You could get one to 1.99 points for something, it will round it down to one on that. And it's actually, this is in the best interest of the provider, yeah, right? this is on purpose. It's yeah. just a joke that I made earlier. <laughs> but the, spar the sparse space in this example will not save you any money because we'll round down, right? So just be aware, um, it, you know, in the giant VMs, right, it's, it's, it'll, it'll, it'll be helpful. But in this example, it actually wouldn't affect the price. But either way, I have a 100 gig virtual machine I'm using one point, right? So think about that for a moment and really look at the value of this uh, from a pricing perspective. So what are some of the typical policies and configurations we see within um, service providers? So Greg and I, you know, we talk to a lot of our providers and we see three different tiers, really, uh, a gold, silver, and bronze tier. Um, Greg and I have a difference of opinion on FTT policies and it, it's gonna be, your mileage is gonna vary between private cloud and public cloud, multi-tenant public cloud on that, and providing availability. It's gonna matter based on the SLAs that you're offering within your cloud provider environment. And we can disagree yeah. because you can do it per VM. That's right, exactly. So yeah. we could set storage policies based off of what I'm trying to actually provide. And within vCloud Director, when we talk about storage policies here, I can actually associate a storage policy on a per organization basis and provide different SLAs between my organizations or tenants associated with that. So think of that for a moment on here. But if we kind of give a broad stroke, gold tier is usually failure to tolerate of two with a RAID one. Yeah, Why RAID one? High performance. I'm minimizing my IO implication and my IO amplification because with RAID five and RAID six, what do we have to deal with? Parity, right? Every write has to propagate out to multiple nodes on here where RAID one, I'm hitting two. So there's an IO impact associated with that. Standard or kind of a silver tier, failures to tolerate of one, RAID five for obviously capacity savings and you know, that general purpose workload. And then a bronze dev, non-prod, again, I'm seeing a failure to tolerate of RAID one, um, excuse me, of one with RAID five. Again, those are some of the things that we see um, and these are great starting um, um, areas of a storage policy. I already talked about sparse swap. Um, you know, this was a concern in the past, but I don't see a lot of my service providers over allocating memory, right? I think a lot of them are very conservative on their memory allocation. So just, you know, again, be aware of what the business requirements are, the technical requirements are, and ensure you have that from a high availability perspective. Uh, Greg already talked about vSAN ready nodes. We have a partnership for VxRail for cloud providers. We have a go-to-market strategy that will actually remove the VMware licensing from the VxRail purchase, and you can use vCPP for this. So um, again, if that is of interest, and we see a lot of private cloud environments using VxRail for uh, cloud providers. Yeah, and as, and as providers push to the edge, which is a very, which is a very, very interesting use case for, for, for our cloud providers, this, this is a nice solution because the vendor, the vendor will you know, install it, support it, you know, if a NIC goes down, all over the world. So um, you, know, you can really extend your reach to the branch of your customer, which everything becomes the branch when they move to your cloud. And that's including managed service. That's an interesting uh, point, Greg, is that if I'm even providing managed services in my tenant's data center, this is something that could be supported and used the licensing program within our Absolutely. platform. Absolutely, makes that. it very so. flexible. Few other notes, um, again, all flash. Uh, we don't really see hybrid models anymore. I think flash has become the prominent, uh, predominant solution. 
And um, you know, the big thing we see with ready nodes, if you're going to build your own, work on your controllers. <laughs> Look at the queue depth, right? Make sure that we're looking at solid controllers and that have a large queue depth. Uh, where uh, Greg and I have seen past challenges is with rolling your own, uh, not being aware of the IO implications, and knowing your workload, right? Um, you know, you, I, I'm sure it's, it comes back to that old adage, you can't put a square peg in a round hole, right? So if you don't know the workload, that is a risk, right? And you need to understand what that is uh, for uh, success. And you gotta that. dig deeper than the ESXi compatibility list. Yeah. I'll just give you a tip. Yeah. yeah so uh, final ta uh, takeaways on kind of uh, some of the best practices. The new um, analytics uh, solution from our storage and availability unit using the customer experience improvement uh, program is awesome. That will actually be proactive support in providing data analytics to GSS, right? So you wanna make sure that we use that where possible, right? And get that rich data um, associated with it. Uh, the storage and availability business unit did a great job with the new assessment tool, which is called Live Optics. It's based off of DPAC, right? So if you've used DPAC in the past, super easy to use, right? And that gets you that rich data on what am I working with with a tenant or an organization, right? How do I size my vSAN environment to sure ensure success, right? And that's the bottom line. Uh, some of the new features that we're seeing with cloud providers is data at rest encryption, legacy clustering uh, using iSCSI for traditional Microsoft clustering services, and then using enhanced stretch clusters. Enhanced stretch clusters, we're seeing more on uh, a private cloud environment or providing a geo um, multi-site data center design on that. So let's quickly touch on some of the integration with our cloud provider architecture. Some of our, um, uh, some of you may have seen, we had several announcements this week for uh, the cloud provider program. One of them is cloud provider pod. Um, Wade Holmes uh, did a session earlier this week on what cloud provider pod is. In summary, what the pod is, is it can orchestrate the entire VMware cloud provider stack. So think of this from a, the best analogy I give is, think of this from vCloud Foundation, but a permutation for service providers. This actually builds out the nodes, everything you need from your management cluster to your payload or resource cluster, along with orchestrating and setting up vCloud Director, the backend RabbitMQ database, um, Cassandra, Postgres, uh, it'll build out VR um, Log Insight, Network Insight, uh, VRI's operations, the tenant plugin. If you want to use extender or uh, vCloud availability, there's an option for this. And so we have a methodical approach on actually designing that, providing a design documentation for your environment, and then actually orchestrating the install. So why am, why am I talking about this? Well, it's going to be at, uh, when we go GA with this uh, shortly, it'll be supported with vSAN, um, all flash along with NFS or iSCSI on that. And this is following our new, um, that will be actually coming out shortly, a cloud provider uh, VMware validated design. Uh, so it's very important, and it's just not even the orchestration capabilities on building out an entire cl cloud provider stack in a matter of hours. It's also the day two operational model. So our goal here is to actually provide update packages that will update the entire stack. Taking guesswork on, is VCD compatible with this version of vSphere, NSX, vSAN, or whatnot? We're testing it. This is gonna be in included on here. Uh, and then another point, this is included in the advanced bundle. There's no additional charge for this for our cloud providers. This is gonna be a go-to-market strategy to ensure one, we have that yeah, consistency. One interesting thing about the pod is if you've ever used VCF, you know you don't get access to the scripts. The automation's all under the covers. We expose all the scripts in CloudPod. You can, you can take them all. So you can orchestrate it, the first one. You can get grab the scripts from it. And maybe you want vSAN in a different way than what the pod provides. Maybe you want NSX in a different way. Um, you, you know, we have to automate all the things. This is a, this is a very nice uh, step in the right direction to, to at least get you close. And it's using VRI's orchestrator. I apologize, I didn't mention yep. that. So it's all using VRO in the yep. back end to orchestrate the entire build up of it. So definitely check it out. It is something that we're investing a lot of money in, in time and energy. And it's something that we're really betting big for our cloud providers. 
So let's talk about vCloud Director Integration. Um, you know, this is really um, an easy to use integrated experience where really at the end of the day, we can take a storage policy inside it from a resource or payload vCenter and register it to a vCloud Director instance. This starts off with creating the policy specific in the payload vCenter, whatever we're trying to achieve, a gold tier of storage policy, silver, whatnot. And then once we have that created, we refresh the vCenter endpoint in vCloud Director. We'll see that new policy populated, and then we can add it as a new storage policy to a provider virtual data center, or PVDC. So this is very easy. The beauty of this is, I mentioned this before, I can provide granular policies based on the SLA I'm offering to that organization within vCloud Director. So if I have Greg's donut shop here, and I wanna make sure I wanna have an FTT of two, but then I have Daniel's bike shop, and you know what, they're paying a lower cost, and I'm making sure I'm just providing bare bones. I can provide a, a separate policy on the same exact vSAN cluster on there while ensuring I'm meeting my SLAs associated with that. So it's a very easy process. We assign it to the PVDC, and then associate it to the organization or tenant uh, virtual data center. And when, you're, when, you're, you know, when your customer self-services, you, you wanna make sure that these are these are d described in a way that they can choose it correctly, right? Because the goal is to offload some of the easy stuff to the customer, right? They can build their own VM, they can choose their storage policy, and, uh, and, and go from there, right? Yeah. I mean, just to, just to boil it down, they can choose the right storage for them. So um, wrapping up here, uh, if you're aware of the vCloud Architecture Toolkit, so Greg is part of, again, the worldwide, oh gosh, I'm gonna say it, the Come cloud, cloud strategy and I'm, I always screw it up, but yes. let's just say it's a global cloud practice Formally and they known create as. the vCloud architecture <laughs> uh, toolkit. These are designs that are meant for you guys on here. Um, a lot of our architects spend a lot of time um, building out these white papers and these reference architectures. There is a storage and availability section that uh, Martin and Foyta have spent a lot of time on showing how vSAN can be adopted for cloud providers. It's free. This is, you're taking the guesswork out of it, right? Get these papers and it really shows exactly how do we integrate within the cloud provider pod and also how we're actually moving forward on that. And, and if you're serious about vSAN, we will come to you and, and, and do the same thing individually, right? So we'll help you figure it out, understand the cost benefit, you know, the business case around it. So uh, some of the next uh, resources that Greg and I use on a common basis, I wrote a blog post on how vSAN sizing works. It covers a lot of the stuff uh, that we covered today, but this is a nice page to go refresh your memory on how vSAN is priced within the program. So got this post. I mentioned my um, script for Horizon Usage, put that up there. Use Live Optics. The vSAN sizer tool is amazing. Um, sat, uh, storage and Availability Business Unit did a great job with that. And that little pie chart at the top, this is a um, GitHub tool that uh, uh, one of the uh, VMware SEs has created. And I have this bookmarked. And when I want to get just a quick and dirty understanding of what the effective capacity is mm -hmm. based off of drive size, uh, what, what is my slack space and whatnot, I can plug in these numbers and I'm able to see exactly what my usable capacity is uh, within a uh, raw vSAN cluster on here. So that's a really nice tool that mm -hmm. I'm able to just plug in the numbers rather than doing back of the napkin calculations. This is a spreadsheet I created um, for uh, some cloud providers going through the vSAN pricing model over a three or five year period. And that's important, why? Well, what happens when I use RAID 5 or RAID 1? What is my price per gig on a monthly basis or on the operational model? And this also takes in consideration of deduplication and compression. It's amazing what dedupe and compression and then using a RAID 5 policy can do for your price model. So I'm not gonna go through this, but this is embedded in the PowerPoint presentation. Here's the QR code I talked about. This is on my Google Drive. Um, you know, I'll st stay here for a moment. Um, we have one last slide and we'll open it up for a Q&A here. But um, you know, as Greg mentioned, uh, we're here for you guys. Uh, we're, we wanna be uh, business partners, uh, help you guys build out the go-to-market strategy and we're here to help that on that from a technical and business perspective. Uh, you know, calling out Greg and Patrick is in the back of the room too. They, these guys provide the pricing analysis and model, operational model to show how to monetize this, right? So it, it is a very strategic offering on that. 
So how you, how you engage the strategy and architecture team is talk to your BDM. So talk to your BDM, the BDM. Or aggregator. Or yeah. aggregator will uh, engage the technical resources and they'll get you, you know, to, to, to you know, level one or level two. And then once you get to level two, they'll engage the strategy and architecture team to come in and take you to 10. And um, really wrapping up, uh, you know, again, we see line of sight uh, growth, revenue perspective for our cloud providers, ease of use, all these implications are profound, right? And, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's a rocket ship. Uh, we're seeing growth month after month of vSAN. I think by default, correct me if I'm wrong, it is our highest growth area right now from a usage perspective. I think uh, within our program, I'll take that, I'll take so. your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure Ari has said that. So, uh, but we've had some serious growth on that. Um, again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, reach out to us. We'll be around here for a while. Uh, is there any questions we can answer? We got about nine minutes left on that. I think you'll get a survey. So if they're yeah. all tens, yeah, that's survey. Perfect. Survey. Yeah. Uh, Man, I don't know if I know that. I mean, we have like about three, uh, 350 to 400 service providers in the program that are using vSAN. Yeah, I think we have so, like tens of thousands. I don't know how many. Yeah, I think the latest statistic I saw was 15,000 vSAN customers. So it's a small percentage compared to enterprise and commercial customers. Yeah, but think about how many service providers there are in comparison to enterprises. I mean, yeah. I think it's. I think the percentage or percentage of penetration into the service provider market is a greater percentage than in the enterprise market, um, easily. Yeah. With uh, file services layouts and potentially object in the future, any changes to the licensing model or is protocol agnostic just based on capacity based? It's going to just be based on usable capacity within that, and uh, I'm not aware of any changes on that. So. Yeah, we don't have any forward-looking data there, but yeah. uh, there's no. There's been. Yeah. There's been no. Uh, so the cloud provider program, we, we, you know, we price our own stuff, so uh, there's no plan that I know of to change it. Thank you all very much. Oh, I'm sorry? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and the Fed ramp on that. So to support Fed ramp, that requires data at rest encryption on that. Um, I know of several service providers that is going through uh, uh, the certification on that, and uh, that is something that's going through. So, 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 v, so vSAN supports so we vSAN. Don't have any vSAN I'm not sure. I understand the question. So, the FedRAMP is a compliance and security um, standard, right? And so, are you talking about cloud providers providing FedRAMP cloud services with using vSAN on that? Uh, there are. Two, I know, um, and then when the AWS GovCloud Gov comes online, that will also be um, a, a FedRAMP certified on that. Yeah, and um, I think but the, there in the is, keynote, they said that was going to be later this year, right? Yeah, there's two US-based ones. I can give you the name after this and tell you about that. So. Yeah. Keep, keep in mind that the application that goes into that environment is the final step in FedRAMP certification. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Yep.